don't make any decisions. We're going to work together for the next few months, quit nothing, find no new job, literally do nothing. She, you know, her stipulation was, can you do that? And at that point, I went, you know what? I don't trust my judgment anymore. So I'm not, I can't even look for a job because I don't know what I'm looking for. Hey there, I'm Goli Kalkaran, and this is Lessons from a Quitter, where we believe that it's never too late to start over. No matter how much time or money you've spent getting to where you are, if ultimately you are not happy, then it's time to get out. If you're feeling stuck and you feel like there's got to be more, there's got to be a way to feel fulfilled and excited about what you do, then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I will sit down with an inspiring guest who quit their professional career in order to forge their own path and create a life that they love. Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me. It means a lot to me. I am so excited about today's guest, Loretta Ihoner, because I think we talk about something really important on today's episode. I think a lot of people feel stuck because they think, I don't know what I want to do. And what if I jump and that next thing is also not something I want or it doesn't pan out the way I want it to pan out? I've left this career, now what do I do? And I think Loretta's story is so important because Loretta has not made one jump or two. She's made six different jumps. And she really talks about the mindset that is needed to really figure out what it is that you want to do and how this decade-long journey for her to find what it is she wanted to do led her to change the way she looks at pursuing different things and making these transitions. I think it is really helpful because you don't have to figure it out. You don't have to have it all figured out right now. There are ways to figure out what you want to do next and take that step and then figure out the next one and the next one and have that confidence that it will work out. And a lot of what we talk about is mindset. And I, as I've said before, I do a weekly newsletter that sends some kind of tidbit that helps you overcome your fear, helps you with clarity of what it is you want to do, provides resources. So if you think that can help you, go to our website, lessonsfromaquitter.com and sign up for that newsletter. I promise I won't spam you. It's just once a week, something that I think can help. And yeah, get on that list. And so without further ado, let's jump into the episode with Loretta. Loretta started her professional life as a medical doctor after graduating from University College London in 2008. After working as a junior doctor at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London for a year, she left medicine to find a career that felt better suited to her. This turned into an almost decade-long journey that included four degrees, five career changes, and six careers, including working as a fashion stylist for Netta Porter, as a TV journalist and producer for the BBC and CNN International, and her latest stint as an entrepreneur starting the very successful website, The Ambition Plan. After noticing the lack of support for career changers in the UK, she founded The Ambition Plan, a digital career change platform for ambitious women who are eager to do fulfilling work, but unsure of what they truly want to do with their lives. The Ambition Plan now provides career clarity coaching, masterclasses, and online expert-led resources to help women across the globe get clear about what they want to do with their lives and create a plan for doing so. Hi, Loretta. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to get into your story. Um, I think there's a lot to cover, so we'll jump right in. But I want to start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about what led you originally to want to go to medical school and become a doctor. Okay. I mean, that's a big question. It's different (laughs) over in the UK from you guys. So I know you guys, you do another degree and then you do medicine as a postgrad. Over here, we don't. So I was still at school and I come from a family of doctors. I did really well in terms of my exams at school. And I just felt a lot of pressure from everyone that said, you're smart, you're good at exams, go and study medicine. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So it was easier to have someone else make that decision for me and for me to just go along with it. So that's really what happened. Yeah, I think a lot of people relate to that. I think a lot of us get kind of funneled in from guidance from our families or parents and we end up going that path. So when you were studying at university, was there a time where you sort of realized like, I don't really love this or I don't want to do this? Or was it not until afterwards when you started practicing as a doctor that you realized it wasn't a fit? 
I always knew it wasn't a fit. I have memories of, I think it was my second day at uni when I called home crying and mm-hmm. saying, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. But, you know, the reception wasn't great. And also, you know, I didn't want to quit at that point. I'd started and I didn't know what else I wanted to do. And that was the main thing in terms of you're there. People would kill to be where you are. You don't know what else you want to do. So you might as well stay exactly where you are until you figure it out. And that's just what happened. And, you know, uni is a great time. You can just, you're making new friends. I moved, I was living up in a small town in the north of England. So I moved to London and it was kind of bright lights, big city. So I was distracted by all of that and I just got on with it. But I knew I didn't want to do it. And I made jokes all throughout med school that, you know, I'm not actually going to be a doctor at the end of this which is why I, I got another degree while I was doing my medical degree, because the plan was I was going to finish that degree. It was a human genetics with nutritional medicine. And I was going to leave and I was just going to do anything. But after I got to three years and did that degree, I felt like a quitter, funnily enough, and everyone else was going to carry on. And I thought, you know what, just do another three years, finish the medical degree and then figure it out. So that's what happened. So in the UK for a medical degree, it was a total of six years. Yeah. Yeah. And is the system there, is the education like paid for? Did you have debt coming out at all or no? Yeah. So, I mean, it's different now because I was in uni over 10 years ago. It's partly paid for and you partly pay for it yourself. So, yes, I do have, I took out student loans for that. It's not to the extent of you guys, but the NHS in your clinical years, that's your final two years, the NHS pays for your study. So that was another guilt factor when I did leave. I remember the dean of my hospital said, you've wasted all of the taxpayers' money um, basically by getting trained and then just deciding to leave. So, you know, well done you for being oh so selfish. Oh, my God. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. So when you are making this decision, like walk us through. So what happens? You're working in gastroenterology. And like, when do you come to the point where you're like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I think hospitals are really depressing places. And in gastroenterology, I literally would say it's the most depressing ward because you're dealing with people's bowels. You come in, it smells gross. It looks gross. Like nothing about it made me happy. And I was already really upset in terms of I felt trapped. And I'd look at my consultants. I don't know what you guys call them there, but those are the very top doctors who've been there for sort of a decade. And they all looked miserable. And they'd be taking it out on the junior doctor. Everyone just looked miserable. And I thought, I'm not going to stay here and work towards being that bitter, twisted person who's just miserable. Everyone looked miserable. That's all I remember. Yeah. And I thought, this is not me. I can't do this. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So when you decide that you don't want to do it, you mentioned earlier that when you had called home during uni and said you didn't want to do it, the reception wasn't good. So how did your friends and family react when you said, you know, now that you've already got the degree and you're working as a doctor, that you don't want to do it anymore? Um, not great. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how honest I want to be. The truth is I quit and then I told them. That's, that's the actual truth of what happened. And I didn't actually admit that I'd quit when I told them. I said, if when the year gets to an end, I'm going to quit, by the way, but I'd actually already quit. <laughs> Oh my <laughs> because goodness. I, I didn't want anyone talking me out right. of it because I tried quit so many times up until then. When I left med school, I said I'm not practicing. I refuse to get registered with the General Medical Council, which is the body here that approves people to be practicing physicians. But everyone said, no, you're crazy. Go and do it. So again, I folded at the last minute. I had to go in and rush my registration. So I just got sick of people talking me out of what I want to do. So I decided I'm just going to do it. And that's what I did. And when you did it, did you have a plan? Like, did you know what else you wanted to do after this? I wasn't sure. And that's how I ended up in fashion. Because when I went to hand in my resignation, they said to me, I mean, the dean and the people in charge of that, because that's how the hospitals are arranged here. You still, even when you're working, you're still in a deanery and they look after your well-being, allegedly. They (laughs) wouldn't let me quit. They sent me for a psychiatric evaluation and they said, you know, this is a crazy decision. If you're quitting, you must have a plan. You're not allowed to quit to nothing. We're not going to sign you off. So that's when I had to say, okay, you know, what do I like doing? Oh, I really love fashion. At that time, I sort of started a fashion blog. I was good at studying. I thought, you know, I'll just go back to uni, get a fashion degree, work out what I'm doing from there. It'll be great. So I presented my great plan to them and they signed me up and said, okay, you know, you, you're not unstable in any way. You can quit your job. So that's how I ended up in fashion. I mean, can we pause right there for a second? That's 
crazy. The fact that you have to like submit to a psychological evaluation because you're saying that you're unhappy in what you're doing and you want to try something else. I mean, talk about the pressure. You know, I think we all already have a little bit of self-doubt when you're making this kind of big step when, you know, society thinks something is so great or you've achieved a certain level of success. It's already so hard to say, yeah, I mean, I am quote unquote successful, but I don't want this. And then to have that self-doubt kind of reiterated and to the extent of saying, hey, you might need to be evaluated for your mental fitness (laughs) because you're making such an insane decision. I can't imagine that kind of pressure. Yeah, no, it was relentless. I even remember my consultant saying, are you sure you want to do this? I'm just thinking about your long-term well-being. And he was telling me stuff about maybe you should just carry on practicing and then do your fashion thing on the side. I don't want you to have any regrets. So it was coming from a nice place. I think it's just, it's very alien. It was almost like yeah. me suddenly announcing to people that I wanted to go live on Mars. Right. And they'd be like, I don't, it was so weird. They're like, I don't think this is a good idea. And you've clearly not thought it through. And people weren't quitting as much as then. They are now because, you know, I do a lot of stuff with kind of startups and I see medical startups and they're full of ex-doctors. So it's becoming more acceptable. But at that time, it was just insane to them that you would study for that long, get that much debt. Right. Go Because I went to quite a prestigious university and I got like, the top job in London that lots of people applied for and didn't get it. So it just seemed mad that I got everything that everyone else wanted and I was just yeah. throwing it away. Yeah. So they were trying to help. <laughs> <laughs> and during that time, did you question? Like, am I crazy for doing this? Like, I'm throwing what everybody is working towards. I'm just going to walk away from this. I might be making a huge mistake. No, no, because by that point, something else was driving me. And that's what's driven me throughout all my career decisions. So what I have, I'm trying to do the maths quickly, 40, well, in this country, 45 years of work ahead of me. It just, it was a no brainer. It was a worse situation to stay in that than to leave. I'd rather leave, have the unknown. And I thought I was still young. I could go back to uni. I could start again. It just, it stopped being a big deal. I love that you say that. I love that you did that. I think so often in law here, we I always talked about how it was like dull level of misery. You know, I think a lot of people were miserable, but they could handle it on the day to day. And I think a lot of times they don't look at the future of like what you said, you're going to work for 45 years. And when you think of it like that, then you start realizing like, no, oh my God, I don't want to do this for that long. But a lot of people don't do that. You know, they don't take the step back. It's just like, oh, get through this day, make it to the next vacation or or I'll switch jobs. You know, maybe I'll go work as a doctor somewhere else. And so I think it, it takes a lot of foresight and wisdom to say, you know what, I have the rest of my life and I don't want to do this. Something funny that I think helped, and it may be tangential or not, it's that, again, I don't know about the US, but in the UK, there's a big drinking culture. And I know that sounds really silly, but there's a big thing of people hating their jobs. And it's fine because on Friday, we're all going to go to the pub and we're going to get drunk and it's okay. I don't drink. So I never <laughs> had that escape. Thing. I really didn't. I was just like, it's always rubbish and there's nothing to look for. <laughs> so I, I think that made me just generally more analytical because there was no escape so I think that helps. Whereas other people, they kind of numb the pain. Right. And then by Monday, they yes. roll through yeah. it. And by Friday, they've got other staff to look for. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. And that was one of the things, actually, I, I don't remember who it was. I When I started wanting to quit and I was listening to different, like, inspirational podcasts. And, and somebody was saying, you know, we don't question it, but it's become accepted in society that, yeah, like, Mondays are the worst. And you just look forward to Friday and you have to make it to Friday. And then you get two days off and then you keep doing it. But like how insane that is to live your life like that, where you hate five days of the week and you're looking forward to two days just to get a break and how that's not normal. And you can try to figure out a way that you actually like all of the days of the week. So, (laughs) okay, so you go back to you need to get a degree in fashion. And then what do you do from there? Then I started interning while I was doing the degree. And I've all, I'm someone who, I don't know if I'm lucky or what, but doors open for me more easily than they do for other people. So I managed to get jobs in like really good places. Like I was working at L'Oreal. I worked mm. at Netta Forte. And I came out, I had no experience. I kind of just sent my CV off, had interviews, did internships, got jobs, and it just worked out organically. So I started doing that. I started doing fashion styling on the side. I just really threw myself into it. But again, I had that thing that I just, it wasn't me. It didn't fit very well. And I also had a really bad reception from the fashion industry. I think it was so weird to them that a doctor was in fashion that they, some people were very condescending. Some people kind of met me with a bit of aggression that I'm not taking this seriously. And this is just a little, you know, quarter life crisis and I'll be leaving soon. So just stay out of the way so we can do our serious fashion work and you can just, you know, it just, I got to say, I thought, you know, I don't need this from you guys. Sorry. 
that I came here to get a break and you're worse than the medics. Like you're actually worse. So I left. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> and so overall, how long were you working in fashion for? That was about 18 months. And when you were leaving, did you have more of an idea of sort of what you wanted to pursue next? No. Um, I remember quitting and then going home and saying, now what? <laughs> That's incredible, though, the fact that you still did it. You know, I think so many of us, because we don't want to face like now telling people, okay, now I tried this and it didn't work. Now what? That we just stay in something we're miserable in so that we don't have to face that. So like, how did you tell, again, like your friends, family, and how did you decide what you were going to do next? For that one, it wasn't a big, oh, I'm leaving fashion. It was just I found a new job and the new job happened to be in a medical newswire writing. You know, it was medical journalism. So all of a sudden I was a medical journalist. So, but there was no great announcement. It just happened. And I said, yeah, I've left. You know, I think I was at L'Oreal at that time. And I said, right, I've left L'Oreal. And then a few months later, it was, oh, yeah, I'm working at a newswire now. And so people say, oh, no fashion anymore. And I'd be like, no, no fashion. This is what I'm doing now. Like, so move on. It's not that big a deal. So when did you go back to school for journalism? So I worked for probably about a year and a half. But I always felt like an imposter. Because I was working with seasoned journalists, you know, they'd say stuff about grammar, they'd say stuff about media law, they, and I'd be like, oh, I don't really, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. So after that, that was my threshold. I remember my boss said to me, because I had to have the discussion with him and said, I have to go part time because I'm going back to uni to get my master's. And she said, I don't know what your problem is, Letta. You know, you're a really good writer. I don't see why you're obsessed with having a degree to validate yourself. But if you have to do this, then go and do it. So that's what I did. And how long was a master's in journalism? Is it one year? Yeah, well, I mean, you can do it over two years, but I was very much like, look, I'm getting old. Let's, let's do this as quickly as possible. So everything was crammed into, I think it was 15 months. And at the same time, I carried on working through that. And I, there was a stage where I was working, interning, and studying all at the same time. And I was doing it in such a sneaky way where I'd take my annual leave to go and intern and then be standing at the same time. It was all, oh, wow. it was a bit of a tight squeeze, but I did it. I want to dig deep a little bit into this because I think that this tends to happen. I see it a lot with people that already have masters and different postgraduate degrees and a lot of education. A lot of times I feel like when we don't know what we to do, we lean back on education. Like it's just like, okay, I should go back to school and get a degree. Do you think that was part of it? I know you, you also said the imposter thing, and that's another thing that I think a lot of us struggle with. I'm convinced that everybody has imposter syndrome and everybody thinks they don't know what to do. And until you realize that everybody is like that and everyone's just trying to figure it out, you feel like, oh, I got to somehow validate it or somehow show that I belong here. And so a lot of us go back, you know, it's like, I don't know exactly what I want to do and I'm good in school and education is always a good thing. So I'm just going to go in until I figure it out. Yeah, it's Definitely. It was easier to say to people. And even now when I've had my blips recently, if I say, but oh, you know, I might just study. No one challenges me on mm -hmm. it. Like, great. It's when you say, I might just sit on the couch for five months and figure <laughs> things out. Then that's not OK. You have to actively be doing something. So that was a big part of it. And I come from a very traditional family. So they understand studying. They don't understand I'm going to sit on the couch for five months and do <laughs> find myself. Yeah, it's really funny because I know it's obviously different in the UK, but in the US, what's interesting to me is that we have to spend a lot to go to school and to get the, especially like postgraduate education. And again, like especially traditional families, they don't seem to bat an eye that you're going to go $100,000, $200,000 in debt to get another degree. But if you say, I'm going to spend $50,000 starting this business, it's like, are you crazy? Like, you've lost your mind. But for some reason, yeah. we always feel that education is always a good investment, where if you don't use it, it, what's the difference between that and investing in something? But it's just this like deep-seated belief that we all have. So, okay, so you get your degree in journalism and you transitioned from a journalism to TV producer? Yeah. So because I did the degree, it opened up new opportunities, just being able to apply for internships. And I remember one of my lecturers said to me, oh, I see you on TV. Yeah, I think you should do TV. And I, every decision I'd made up, up until that point had actually been based on people saying, I see you doing this. And that's how I ended up in medicine. That's how, you know, fashion blog turned into a fashion career. And that was the same thing with journalism. But I was minding my business. My idea was that I was going to be a magazine journalist. I wanted to get into sort of health and fitness magazines. Once that person said, go to TV, I kind of went, yeah, let's do it. And then I saw an internship at CNN. So I applied, no experience. No, I literally just applied and then I got it. And that's what I mean, that thing's happening mm. just quite easily for me. So that then threw me into TV land because I said, oh, it's a sign, you know, it's a sign yeah. of the universe. I'm yeah. meant to be. 
told me to do it and I got in. So I just went down that route because I am i don't do things half-heartedly. So I went in there and I made it my mission to turn an internship into a job. And that's exactly what happened. And then from there, I just kind of carried on making it happen. That's incredible. But I, I want to pause about what you're saying about you being lucky, which, you know, I'm, I'm not doubting that you have a great luck. But I actually, in our newsletter last week, I sent out this article by researchers about luck. And it, it's funny because it's people that think they're lucky tend to be more lucky and people that think they're unlucky tend to be more unlucky. And they did these experiments where they had people look through advertisements and they asked them to like count how many pictures. And the people that had said that they were lucky, like on the second page, there was like a full page ad or a half page ad that said, stop looking. There's like 47 pictures. And the people that said they were lucky saw that more often. And the people that were unlucky were focused on counting the pictures and just skipped that and kept counting. And so there is this thing, and you were saying you are lucky, but you're saying, you know, you applied for that CNN job. Most people would say, oh, I don't have experience, so I'm just not going to do it. You know, like they they would never take me. Or when you're saying, you know, I'm determined and I was going to turn that internship into a job. So it's not just luck. It's a matter of that you're putting yourself out there and you're doing it. And I think that's the lesson in all of this is from everyone we talk to. It's like you put that one foot in front of the other and you go after what it is, even if you don't know what it's going to be in 10 years or five years. It's like, what do you want right now? And you do it. So I think it's a lot more to do with your ambition and your drive and actually taking those risks. And clearly, you know, like you've been taking risks and you're doing it kind of your own way and figuring it out. And I think a lot of us just sit back and wait for something to show up. And it's like, oh, I want this. And that's never going to happen. Yeah, exactly. No, you're right. I mean, luck probably isn't the best word. What I should have said, it's more that I'm good at making things happen, if that makes sense. But a lot of it has to do with fear I mean, half of it has been fear of failure drive me. But the other thing is also, I can't find a nice way to say it, but I have this thing where I almost don't, I can't think of a nice way to say it. It's like I don't respect things that other people respect. You know, some people just get very scared about things. Yeah. You know, if they're going to meet celebrities, they're like, oh my God, this person's amazing. I'm so, and I, whilst I'm like, there's just a human being, I don't care. Let's get on with it. I'm like that with everything. So I'd go into, you know, the TV industry and maybe someone else would be intimidated by that. But I was kind of like, these are just people milling around an office with a camera. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> Let's just do it. And I feel like having that attitude is the thing that has helped me get into things that other people might not even try because they're scared of this thing. And I not really that scared. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, yeah. That's a great attitude to have. And I think that's with everything, even this stuff of, you know, quitting and being stuck. I'm wondering if you have the same experience. It's a lot of people make it such a big deal and create such a huge thing about like, oh, I can never. And then once you have it like, okay, it's not that big of a deal. You quit, you tried something else. And if that doesn't work, then you'll try something else. Once you stop making these fears bigger than (laughs) what the reality of it is, then you realize that you're not stuck. I think that's the attitude that got me to make five career changes (laughs) because when I made the big one and the world didn't end, I kind of went, okay, well, I can do it again. So every time I get into a situation where I hate it, I'm like, right, well, I can just leave and start again because I've done it so many times. Yeah. Um, yeah, But it has detriments because you can't take it too far, obviously. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I I think you can, but I do like what you're saying because I think a lot of times, a lot of people listening to this probably because they haven't taken even that first jump to hear like, oh, I've made five career changes sounds, you know, foreign. Like you're speaking another language. Like what does that even mean that you've jumped this many times? But for me, having made that jump, I feel the same exact way now. I think, wow, it was so much easier than I made it in my head. And so now I don't ever, I mean, I I don't even see the need of having like a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. It's like, who knows what I'm going to be doing in five years or 10 years. I'll figure it out as I go along. Before, I mean, I was like a 20-year plan. Like I knew exactly what (laughs) I was going to do. And then once you realize like that's crazy and you can adjust to life as it comes to you and in the different stages in your life, then it does give you the courage to do that a lot faster than most people. Okay. So you, you were in journalism, both print journalism and TV for a good chunk of time. You said about eight years, right? Yeah. I'm on and off. Yeah. Right. Okay. So then what happens that you decide you're, you're done with journalism and you want to try something else? So I wasn't done with journalism per se, but I was done with TV just because I was working on these hard news channels. It was 24 hour rolling news. You came in hoping bad things happened to to people. That's what happened. You wanted people to be blown up. You wanted people to be killed. You wanted people to go missing. And if something, you know, they had a good ending, you'd prepare all these stories and your package would be ready to go. And then the missing kid was found and everyone would be like, junk it. Or do you see what I mean? Or they thought the parent was going to do something and then he didn't. It was, oh, our story's over. So every day was just being around negativity 
And I remember I was in the newsroom one time and it was, gosh, it must have been 2015 because it was when that Charlie Hebdo massacre happened in Paris. And footage was coming in that they were filming and there were people being blown up. And this is going to sound awful, but people in the newsroom were cheering. <sighs> and I was really, I cried about it. And I thought, I'm so emotionally affected by this. This is ridiculous. And because for me, I was like, these are people. I don't understand what's wrong with these people, but these are human beings and they're being killed. And you guys are cheering because of your ratings. Like, this is not okay. And this is not the environment I want to be in. So I left. That was the thing because I thought, I don't want to be like this. And I don't want it to be normal for me to be happy that people are being killed. Whether I know them or not has nothing to do with it. They're human beings, and that's not okay behavior in my eyes. So, yeah, wow. that was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so, again, like, what did you do afterwards, and how did you kind of figure out what you wanted to do next? So that was the time that I did take some time out, and I spent a few months looking for jobs. <laughs> I say that because I wasn't looking all that hard <laughs> because I was trying to work out what do I want to do, and that's when the plan of the nutrition consulting came into my head because – I myself have had my own weight loss struggles in the past. I did study, you know, my first degree was a bachelor's in, as I said, it was in human genetics. And I did this big research piece about nutritional genomics and how, you know, our genes affect the way we process certain foods. So I had that knowledge and it was an interest. I was blogging at that time. And this always turned, blogs always turned into jobs for me. I had a nutrition blog. So it was a health nutrition blog that was demystifying or debunking myths. So because I spent a lot of time bashing stupid diets, organically, people started asking me, like emailing me and saying, okay, well, if, you know, I don't know, the South Beach diet is ridiculous, what do you recommend? So accidentally, I started getting clients because people wanted my dietary advice. So that turned into a business where I went back, not to uni, but I did a sort of a nutritional medicine certification in a specific type of nutritional diet program. And so I just started coaching people on that, started doing more of the blogging and monetizing it. And that's what I did for, again, 18 months. But then I started doing some freelance journalism because obviously when you run the consultancy, it's very much stop and starting it. It's not constant. It's not a constant flow of money. So I accidentally fell back into journalism just to top it up. But I think, again, 18 months of that, which seems to be my threshold, <laughs> I remembered why I left medicine. I didn't like the patient facing stuff. I didn't like these people coming to me all the time for nutrition advice and being really, really needy. Again, it sounds terrible, which is why I think it's a good thing that I'm not practicing anymore. I didn't want the weight of their burden on my shoulder. I didn't want to be responsible. They would freak out and they'd be sending me pictures and texts of their meals. And I accidentally ate a biscuit and it was just too much. I was literally at the point where I thought, if you want to eat a biscuit, eat a biscuit. I don't care. I really <laughs> right. don't care about that. Right. And that for me was a sign that this is, you shouldn't be doing this. You just don't care about what, what is happening. So yeah, yeah that's the drawing board. <laughs> okay. So and you recently posted about this on your Instagram for the ambition plan, which we'll get to next, but you were saying that you were at the tail end of this 18 months and you hated it, but you couldn't face having to explain to everyone that this career had lost its appeal too. So walk us through that a little bit. I mean, even for yourself, I mean, were you at a point where you were thinking like, am I ever going to find something that I love? Or maybe this is just, you know, everything that is exciting, it's going to lose its appeal and I'm constantly going to need to be changing. Was there this fear of never finding something that's going to fulfill you? Yeah, but I thought there was something wrong with me and I had people around me telling me there was something wrong with me. Not sort of family and things like that. It was usually disgruntled employers who were not happy that I wanted to leave their job that they thought was amazing. Because at the same time as I was doing the nutrition consulting, I at the end of it, I started working as a magazine editor, again, for like a health and fitness publication. So I was doing both of those simultaneously and just really didn't like it. And it was a really bad, the place I was working at was just, it was the worst employment experience ever, just toxic workplace, times 100, horrendous. So I wanted to get out of there. But again, yeah, I had that thing of, God, I can't believe this has failed yet again. But at the same time, I've always been interested in entrepreneurism, always wanted to have my own business. My issue has been, I never wanted to be responsible for my own paycheck, I guess, because I didn't believe that I could bring in that income. So I would always start stuff because when I look back now, I've started three businesses and then not actually follow them through because I got scared and then dumped it. So when I was in that other bad job and I was thinking, I can't do this again, blah, blah, blah. I actually went and did some work with a coach. 
And actually, in my kind of professional life, I've had about three coaches because I have these things where I think, ah, I'm doing something wrong. Someone help me. Mm -hmm. I worked with a coach who was so much different from any other coach I'd worked with. And that she wasn't actually a coach. It was someone who we worked on just clarity and just finding that place where you have space to think. And you do. I remember when I went to her, the first thing she said was, don't make any decisions. We're going to work together for the next few months. Quit nothing. Find no new job. Literally do nothing. She, you know, her stipulation was, can you do that? And at that point, I went, do you know what? I don't trust my judgment anymore. So I'm not, I can't even look for a job because I don't know what I'm looking for anymore. So I literally 100% surrender to you. Do with me what you will because I don't trust myself anymore. And that was, that was really bad for me in terms of realizing that because I said, you've made five wrong turns. There's something wrong with your judgment. It stinks. So <laughs> you can't make decisions about your life anymore. Someone else has to do it for you. So that's what I did. I just sat down and just went through that process which funnily enough is what gave birth to the ambition plan and what I do now is put other people through that process because <laughs> I saw how amazing it is because you make decisions so much more right. quickly when you give yourself space to think than when you try and do things from a logical place well, because you make decisions based on panic. Yeah, absolutely. I think that a lot of times, especially when we have early on, like I said, quote unquote success, and you have this plan that you're following along through college and university, and you get this traditional job. A lot of times what's difficult is right afterwards, you want to find something immediately. Like if you don't like this, okay, what's next? What's next? And it's kind of like, I want to figure this out. And it is an evolution and it always takes a long time. And, you know, one thing leads to the next. But I do think that what you were saying, what a lot of people are really scared to sit in is where you were at. It's a really hard place to be to say, like, I don't trust my own judgment. I don't know. I don't know what I want to do. And I think that's where a lot of people that listen to this podcast are stuck, but they have no idea what they want to do. And they don't trust that they can just figure something out and it's going to work out. And so that fear is like, well, at least I know, you know, I have a stable paycheck. I know what this is. I'm just going to stay in this. So the fact that you could sit in that and find someone to help you through that, I think still takes courage because so many of us don't want to feel that discomfort yeah I mean for me it was kind of I always talk about if a situation if you're meant to do something and you don't want to do it and you're not you know you're not reading the signs if you want to call it the universe god or whatever then you will be pushed and I was put I very much believe that I was put into that horrible the worst job ever mm -hmm. honestly I couldn't even go into horrible but I was put into that situation to push me mm -hmm. into making the decision to go and do the thing I always wanted to do which was have my own business it needed you know see what I mean the driving factor had to be so strong if it wasn't if it was an okay job I would probably still be in there complaining right but I'd still be there right. so it gets to the stage where yeah I feel like there's a tipping point and you have no choice you just have to leave because your sanity and self-respect is worth a lot more than any paycheck that anyone claims to be giving to you. And then you realize you can figure things out. Oh, absolutely. So tell us a little about how the Ambition Plan was born and what it is now. Sure. So the Ambition Plan is a digital platform for career changes. It's very much focused on women only because I think with the workplace at the moment, women still are not on an even footing with men. So it's nice to have spaces that champion women. It's for people who don't know what they want to do essentially. And it's celebrating that because as I said, for a decade, I felt shamed about not knowing you know, what I wanted to do. So we provide a lot of services. The main thing is career clarity coaching. We have a team of coaches that will work one-to-one -one with people. We've got group coaching programs coming up. We run masterclasses and events where we connect people who... So we look a lot at the creative industries. So we will find people at the top of the game of different creative fields and we will put them front and center with women who think, oh, I quite, you know, I think I might want to do this, but I'm not sure. And just let them find out all the things that people don't tell you about what a career really involves. So it was just, it's all about giving people a space of empowerment. And then we have a job board, which is full of sort of handpicked jobs specifically for career changers, because that's another big obstacle that's faced. It's how, you know, I want to get into the industry. I'm not qualified. I've got no experience and I don't know anybody. So we try and remove those barriers by going out there and speaking with a lot of people and finding these jobs and then presenting them to career changers. That sounds wonderful. And I think that going back to both you going to coaching and then what you're saying that the ambition plan is, is I think coaching is now becoming more accepted and people realize even in their lives they can get different types of coaches, but I don't think it's as mainstream as maybe it should be. And I think people 
don't realize that there are people that are, you know, a couple steps ahead of you that can really help. And so yeah. like you said, the clarity that comes from just talking to someone that was in that position or someone that deals with people like this all the time that can help you kind of get unstuck can save you years, you know, in the learning curve of what it is you want to do or to get you to the next step. And there are these types of resources like the Ambition Plan and other career consulting websites out there that can help people that feel stuck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So do you have any advice, you know, having now started this from the website and and the resources that you guys offer and the people that you've helped, do you have advice for somebody that feels stuck right now, like feels miserable, but doesn't know what to do, doesn't know what the next step should be, what they should start with? I think there are a couple of things that are important. The biggest thing is not making any decisions from a place of fear. I think it's important to really give yourself time to think. And to think comprehensively, because again, I, you know, I speak with a lot of people with coaching clients and when I get them on, you know, our initial calls, a thing a lot of them do that I used to do is they say, well, these are the skills and the experience I've got. So I need to find a job that matches that. And I have to say, okay, start you're know, doing things back to front. What do you want to do? Forget about what society says you can do based on the experience you have. Mm-hmm. Forget about that and what do you want to do? And if you start from a place where you're just looking at what do I like? A big, t- not task, a big, what's the thing? Example I give is if you won the lottery, so you were now just going to do a job for fun, what industry, what field, what does that look like? And that gets people thinking. And that's when they start talking about what they really want to do, what they really enjoy. And, but most of the time they finish it with, oh, but I can't, no one would ever pay me to do that, would they? And then that's when we have the discussion of, guess what? <laughs> it's a digital age now. You can get paid for doing anything. Right. You just have to work. I have to turn that into either your own business or into a service you provide to someone else or going in-house in the company and providing that service. But it's doable. So once people start seeing that, then the opportunities expand. So yeah, don't limit yourself. Get about what you've got, the tools you bring to the table. Just focus on you as a person. Like, what do you enjoy doing? And where does not, I don't want to like saying the word passion anymore because I feel like yeah. it's a very loaded, high pressure word. But yeah, if you won the lottery, what would you do for fun? Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. I think getting out of all the programming or thinking what you can do or what's available to you and just really sitting down and thinking about not even job tasks, but what do you like doing on a day to day basis? You know, I think I did that where I made lists of what are like literal tasks. Uh, I like talking to people. I like doing, you know, X, Y, and Z. And kind of getting an understanding of just things that you enjoy and then shaping that into a career. And like you said, now with the internet, I mean, there's so many more opportunities to turn anything into a business. And so, and we've seen that a lot on this show. I think a lot of people have talked about things that aren't traditional businesses or brick and mortar. We just had Tyler McCall on the show and he's an Instagram marketer. And he was telling us about his clients who like makes tens of thousands of dollars a month selling salad dressing recipes. You know, I mean, it's just crazy <laughs> the amount that yeah. the possibility out there. And so you yeah. kind of have to open yourself up to that. And it comes with practice because a lot of people are conditioned. So we, you have to just keep doing the research. And, and it, like you said, it's finding people out there who are doing exactly what you yes. want to do and realizing you don't have to go down the path that everyone else has gone down. There's another way to do things. Yes, absolutely. Are there any other like books that you would recommend or resources that people check out and maybe they could check it out on the Ambition Plan website, but something that they can help maybe in changing mindset or getting them started? So favorite books are Four Hour Workweek. That's a really good one. Just making you realize it's what you said before about people living for the weekend, that your mindset is back to front, that most of us want to enjoy life and you can build a life that you enjoy all the time. So that's great for that. Something else that's more spiritual, philosophical, that it's kind of hate, love and hate, but it's The Alchemist. I love oh, that book yeah. by yeah. Paolo Coelho. First time I read it, I hated it because you have to be in a really miserable place to <laughs> feel aligned and get the joy from it. If things were, the first time I read it, things were okay. So I kind of went, this book is really <laughs> obvious and literal, ridiculous. I don't know why it's so famous and everyone loves it. And then when I was in a really kind of dark place and read it, I kind of went, oh my God, <laughs> this is what I need in my life. And I've read it probably 10 times. Yeah. I bring it out every time things are a bit and I need just reassurance. Right. I bring it out. So that is a great book for reassurance. Other things I found really helpful, again, it's not really to do with careers per se, but if you're going towards the business side like I was, but you don't have faith in yourself in terms of making money, then it's doing a lot of money mindset work and loads and loads of different sort of resources out there for that. 
something I found useful. Again, I don't, I have not affiliated with it in any way, shape or form, but there's a woman called Christy Marie Sheldon and that's her big thing. Mm. And she works with Mind Valley, and her thing's all about working on your money mindset. And I've done a lot of her stuff and I've seen huge differences once I start realizing that I limited myself mm. in how high I pitched myself and what I kind of went for. And it was all to do with preconditioning and how I was yes. brought up and beliefs I had about money. So that even if you, you know, you don't have to go down her route, but just starting to read stuff about that and just understanding how you limit yourself, it can transform your life in terms because you will just go for things that you didn't go for before and you will find success and money and all of that stuff suddenly starts coming your way. And I'm not saying you're going to turn to a millionaire overnight, right. but you will notice that things never worked out. Suddenly you're working right. out and everyone's saying, oh, you're really lucky. And you're thinking, yeah. well, I'm not. I'm <laughs> doing the work, but I'm lucky because before it wouldn't have occurred to me to do these things. So yeah, so those are three things I recommend. I love those. I will link them in the show notes. I have the four-hour work week on the resource page of the website as well. I think it's a brilliant one. And I love what you just said. I think that A lot of times what I run into, I think, especially like with the audience of this kind of podcast is people that have taken the traditional route and we kind of roll our eyes to a lot of this like self-help, like, oh, okay, changing my money mindset. I don't have a money mindset. And we don't realize how conditioned we are to think things are a certain way and how much it's just your thought. You know, it's not reality. It's just a thought. Like you were somehow they put this thought into you that you can do X or you can't do X or this is too much money or this is not enough money and whatnot. And so- when you start really reevaluating that stuff, you know, not just with money, with everything, like I said, like with what's possible for you to do for work and, and everything, it is life changing to see like, hey, I don't have to limit myself to, in this box and there's a million other yeah. things I can do and I can make money and I, I'm not an imposter and I could do all this stuff. So I <laughs> could not agree more that I think like 80% of this is just mindset. It's just changing your yeah. mindset and realizing you're not stuck. You're not, you know, that you can do other things. So that's great. So why don't you let everyone know where they can reach you, where they can see your work on the ambition plan, and maybe if they have any follow-up questions. Sure. So it's it's nice and simple. It's just theambitionplan.com. That's the website. And then in terms of social media, all our handles, we're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and even Pinterest. It's just at theambitionplan. So yeah, nice and easy to find. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here, Loretta. I think that this was incredible. Your journey is incredible. And I think it's very inspirational for a lot of people that are feeling like they don't know what they want to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And yeah, I hope it does help (laughs) someone, even if it's just one person, to realize that you can do anything you put your mind to it once you start believing in yourself. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I can't tell you how much it means to me. If you liked the podcast, please rate and review us on iTunes. It'll help other people find the show. If you want to connect or reach out, follow along on Instagram and Facebook at Lessons from a Quitter and on Twitter at Quitter Podcast. I would love to hear from you guys and I'll see you on the next episode.